Thank you all for coming. Uh, always an honor to come and give talk here in Amin's uh, home uh, institute. Uh, so, um, yeah, let me start. Uh, this is a long talk, so I, I don't want to waste any time, but please feel free to stop me any number of times, ask me any questions, please. Um, and, and I'll also make pauses because sometimes things take a while. And if I'm going too slow, too fast, let me know. So here's what uh, online bipartite matching is. Uh, I think I'm going to just stand here so that I'm a little distant from it. Um, and and, and I, I'll write a few things also on the board later. So uh, think of a bipartite graph on n goods and n buyers. Uh, and the edges just specify the fact that a buyer likes that particular good. And the goods are sitting here, and uh, each buyer wants at most one of these goods. And uh, the buyers come online one at a time. And each time a buyer comes, you know which goods uh, this buyer likes. And you have to match this buyer to one of these goods irrevocably and immediately and move to the next buyer. Okay, so let's say we match her to the that third good. Then the next buyer comes, we match like that. And the next buyer comes and uh, both of her desirable goods are matched. And uh, so whereas uh, there is a matching of size three here, we got only a matching of size two. And, uh, you know, it's our fault because we made some wrong choices. Uh, but really speaking, it's not our fault because we didn't know the future. We didn't know what was going to come. Uh, and that's the whole game. How to make decisions without knowing the entire input. Uh, okay. So, so the uh, thing to do here is called uh, competitive analysis. That's the technical word for the kind of uh, approximation you look for. Uh, and it's defined to be like this for deterministic algorithms. You, uh, you design... Uh, for, for, for any algorithm, uh, its competitive ratio is given by the minimum overall instances of the size of the matching produced divided by n, because we'll always assume that the instance has a perfect matching, which has, of course, size n. And the instance also has encoded in, in it the arrival order of the buyers. And so this is the worst case analysis, overall graph and arrival orders, okay? And uh, another way to view it in a, is, is I find it much simpler. I, I don't know, most people find it much simpler is to think of it as if uh, an adversary who knows our algorithm, our deterministic algorithm, picks the graph and the arrival order, okay? And, and we see the worst case right there in that worst case graph and arrival order, right? Um, so it's very easy to see that the deterministic uh, competitive ratio is at least a half because our algorithm is greedy. It'll always match a buyer if it's possible. So it'll yield a maximal matching and that's at least half the maximum matching. So, and, and, and moreover, that's, you cannot do better. And the adversary gives us a bad graph like this, uh, gives these two edges. And uh, if the algorithm matches there, uh, he puts uh, an edge there. And if the algorithm matches like this, then he puts an edge there. And so, so always we get one edge and he gets two edges, so, so we are stuck at half. So any deterministic algorithm can be forced into a half. So to do better, you have to use randomization, and then the competitive ratio becomes the expected size of the matching divided by n. And in this, the, uh, the adversary is not adaptive. So the adversary first picks the graph and the arrival order, arrival order and knows the algorithm, but not the coin flips. Knows the algorithm, but not the coin flips. Okay, so, so after the adversary picks the worst graph and the arrival order, uh, the algorithm flips coins and executes. Okay, and one obvious algorithm, really, really obvious one, is that you uh, give each buyer, uh, match each buyer to a random available good. By available, I mean, that the edge is present and the good has not been matched so far. Okay, among all those edges, uh, all those goods which are available, pick a random one. 
And that's actually not much better than half because of the following example. So here I'm gonna give you the, the adjacency matrix of uh, that, this particular bad byproduct graph. So, so uh, the rows are the goods and the columns are the buyers and the arrival order is N, N minus one, so on in that order, okay? And what does this um, adjacency matrix have? It has a N over two by N over two um, sub matrix of all ones. So all those edges are present, complete bipartite graph there and a perfect matching setting on the diagonal. Okay, so let's see what happens when random executes on this. Uh, it's obvious that, okay, so um, if the algorithm gets K diagonal edges in, in diagonal matches here in the first N over two arrivals, then the uh, size of the matching will be N over two plus K. That's very, very easy to see because, because whenever you make a diagonal one here, then that then a row is freed up among the first n over two and that will match here. But if it keeps matching right here, then there's nothing left to match after that, right? So, so the more diagonal uh, matches you get early on, the better off you'll be. But how will you get lots of diagonal uh, matches when you're picking a random one out of this column? Most likely you'll end up here in that sink. And so in fact, uh, this does only marginally better. By, so it's just half, half plus log n over n, not, no better. And that's very easy to see. So how should we do better, right? Uh, because that, I mean, how can you beat that algorithm? That's kind of, in some sense, the natural algorithm, right? Um, uh, so here's a hint. The algorithm should be minimalistic. Uh, so I will not go into, this is the whole talk in itself. Uh, but I want to say that, that the best algorithms are three or four lines, okay? And the algorithm for online bipartite matching is only two lines, <laughs> so it's even better. So namely, first randomly permute all the goods once, just once, and then match each buyer to the highest available good in that random order. If you randomize on each buyer arrival, it's lost already, it becomes same as random. So don't do that. Just randomly permute the goods once and each time a buyer comes, match her to the highest available good. Okay, so let's see how this does on the on that bad example. So uh, again, so the rows are the goods, and they'll be randomly permuted once, and the columns will still come in this uh, order. And any column, uh, so these rows have been permuted. So, so some of these uh, bottom ones will go to the top, and the top ones will go to the bottom, obviously. And this, any one column may look like this. It will have the, the, the red, red entries are, are uh, the non-diagonal entries. So some of them are from the top, namely the ones. Some of them are from the bottom, namely the zeros. And then there's a black one, which is the unique diagonal one. Okay. So what happens? Uh, all the previous columns also have the same pattern of red entries, obviously. And if a previous column gets a bad match, that means matches of some of the one of these red ones, that improves the chance of a good match now. Okay, and that's the key to the algorithm. So if I ask you for one word, this uh, idea of why this algorithm is good, can anybody give me a one word summary of why this algorithm is it would be good? So. The early bad matches improve the chance of a good match later. So what's the one word way of describing it? Well, the algorithm is self-correcting. Okay, so this two-liner is, 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 is doing all of that work for us. Okay, so. That for this example, it will do about three quarters. Yeah, but, but uh, in the worst case is one minus one over eight. Yeah, yeah. good, yeah. So, so uh, this is problem we solved, uh, we being uh, Dikarp, Omesh, Vazrani, and me. In 1990, we proved a competitive ratio of one minus one over eight. We also showed that it's uh, optimal. No, no algorithm can do better than by a little of one additive term using Yao's lemma, and all that, the standard machinery. Um, but the, the problem was that the, the analysis was very difficult. 
uh, people just stayed away from this paper. And eventually, uh, it started getting simplified. The first simplification was done by two of my students, uh, Gagan Goel and Aranyak Mehta in 2008. Then uh, uh, Claire Matthew and uh, her student did uh, a further improvement. And now it was accessible to many people, but it was not by any means teachable in a class. Uh, and then uh, Nikhil Devanur, Kamal Jain, and Bobby Kleinberg used a randomized primal dual approach to give a, a far simpler analysis. Okay. And, uh, and finally, I have to. I'm having too many things. Okay. So, and then uh, uh, Michal Feynman, uh, Emma Sviet, and two students here uh, gave this, this particular scheme. Uh, they, they redistributed the quantities in a different way, gave it an economic interpretation. And all of a sudden, the analysis, which was, has, had become simple enough, became also very, very elegant. And I completely fell in love with this. And, and uh, the book that I mentioned, in, uh, oh, it's not mentioned, there's a book coming out on matching markets for which I was writing, writing a chapter uh, on this stuff. And I used this particular, well, basically ideas from these two works. And, and the more I got into it, the more I loved it. And I simplified a little bit more, which I'll present now. And then the idea came, now that it's so simple, why don't extend it? So I'm gonna show you the extensions that are possible and leave you with some very, very important open problems, very big, important, difficult open problems. Anybody who solves it, uh, well, okay, this is uh, <laughs> addressing a multi-billion dollar industry, if I may say so. So uh, uh, here, is, here is the economic way of thinking about ranking coming from those two works, basically the combination of those two works. So here is, uh, so for each good, uh, at, in the first step, uh, each good picks a random number in the interval zero to one and computes a price pj, which is e to the wj minus one. That's the price. And then the buyers come one at a time and they, buy, uh, they match to the cheapest available good. And obviously uh, these will buy with probability one, all the prices will be distinct and you'll get a random permutation of goods here, obviously. And so this is basically the same algorithm. All right? Any any questions here? Because this is this is like the key thing to on which I'll do this this way of thinking about the algorithm. Any particular reason why the minus one? Yeah, yeah. This is all optimized completely. To you could have many different ways, but this has been optimized, and there are nice proofs. Not very hard. Yeah. yeah good question, though. Yeah. Uh, if you go to my webpage, you'll see. Lots of stuff on all of this, including a chapter on online matching, which has this optimization by a student of mine and Huang, a current student of mine, Corbin Frost. Okay, uh, so so let's try to analyze this version with an economic angle, and the economic angle, uh, of course, is that uh, that each buyer has a unit demand and wants only one good and has zero one valuations, in other words, for, for the goods, all, all the goods she wants are equally good and she wants at most one of them, or exactly one of them to be, you know, optimize her happiness uh, and, and none of the others, right? Even if they are available, okay. Uh, and uh, if a ma buyer I matches to good J, there's a gain of one in the matching, that will be divided into two parts two quantities. One is the revenue and the other is the utility. The revenue is the revenue of good J, which is defined to be the price. And the utility is that of the buyer, which is defined to be one minus PJ. So think of it as this, the, the buyer accrued a utility of one for, for, by getting the good, but had to pay a price of PJ. Therefore the net utility she got was one minus PJ. And this is, these are central uh, notions I will, just write them on this board. Yeah, the Zoom people will not be able to see, but that's uh, right. but okay. If you, yeah. Should I write it? Know. Everybody here is very smart. I don't know that I need to write it. Maybe you don't have to write it. It's, okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so no, no, I think it's good to write. I'm it's not good so to write. So write. Yeah, and at least the people in the audience will see. 
If I were in the audience, I would have written it, but <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay. okay. So, uh, so the so if I matches to J. Okay. Uh, let me say I match. Uh, I matches to J. Then you have a gain of one, and then that goes into a revenue of J, which is uh, P J, and utility of I, which is one minus pj and and uh, and and the ut utility of i is zero if uh, if i remains unmatched uh, the revenue of j is zero if j remains unmatched right by definition and uh, just note that uh, pj rj and ui are random variables obviously uh, pj is a random variable which is set in the first step of the algorithm and as the buyers come in this whatever order is determined by the adversary um, depending on the pjs matches will be made and and the pjs will influence uh, rjs and uis in the obvious manner given by this uh, algorithm right so all these random variables will be determined in this way okay given given, given that uh... The algorithm that Russell doesn't know the randomness. Does not know. Might, might as well assume that the uh, order is uh, determined. Oh, the graph itself is uh, the yeah is not determined yet. So, so, so the, it determines the graph. The graph and the order, but the randomness is in our hands, of course. Uh, uh, if the randomness is given to the adversary, then the uh, oh, graph. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and one last thing to note here is a small technicality. PJ is in this uh, interval because when you set at WJ to zero or one, you will get these endpoints. And then one minus PJ will be in this interval, zero to one minus one. Okay, I'll use these intervals in a little while. You don't have to remember them and I will put them down again. So here's a very central lemma. Very central lemma says that, that for each edge IJ, each pair ij which is an edge if it's not an edge then no nothing to be said about it so for each edge ij the utility of buyer i plus the the expectation of the utility of buyer i plus the revenue of good j is at least 1 minus 1 over e for every edge in the graph of course not independent of all the other edges these are expectations Okay, there's lots of de dependence between the edges, but we know we can always use linearity of expectation and derive many facts about this. So let's derive a nice fact, namely that uh, the competitive ratio of this algorithm ranking is one minus one over e. Wait, are you going to explain why this lemma is? Possible? Of course, I'm going to prove the lemma. Okay, good. But but modulo the proof. Let me prove the theorem, and that's uh, an obviousity because. Uh, the expected size of the matching, you know, the matching has been sprinkled into UIs and RJs, and we collect them along one perfect matching, which we know exists in the graph. And each of these terms is one minus one over E, so we get N times one minus one over E. If there's no perfect matching in the graph, the maximum matching is size K, it'll be K times one minus one over E, still giving you a competitive ratio of one minus one over E, right? I think I'm gonna home in on. Uh, is this like at least? I mean, is it equal to or it should be? This equal? is this is oh, uh, equal to because we sprinkled the one into the UI and RJ. This is equal to because we just collected terms. And you match. This them. is at least because uh, because this is also at least. Yeah, I'm gonna use you as the because you're the only student here, right? Um, I don't know. Oh, one more. Oh, three more. Okay. So you you told me how fast to go. Okay. If you, if you want to slow me down, please do. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. So, so, so we are we are happy with this. So we are down to one lemma, right? Wow, thirty-two years of work, and we are down to one lemma. Started with one theorem. So, huh? okay. <laughs> the one theorem is is gone. It's done. If there's only one lemma to be proved. Okay. So let me describe several different runs of the algorithm. Okay. Now. Um, and what do I mean by that? I'll say in a minute after it defined. For each good j, let g, g sub j define be the graph in which uh, good j has been removed. 
and we'll define gj for every j. Okay. Now these runs of the algorithm are are defined through only one randomization. The first step is common to all these runs. So we execute the first step and then we run the second step in many over in many different ways. One is the normal way which is the run on g itself and one is for each good j we run it on the graph without good j and that I'll call uh, rj. So r is a run on the graph itself, entire graph, and rj is a run on the graph minus good j. Sorry, what does it mean to say random bits are flipped once? So the step one is done once, and then you branch out. Okay, we're not gonna flip coins again. And then in the uh, branch out into n plus one different runs, the first run is on r, uh, on g, the ne next n runs are on g sub j. Okay. And that's key. I mean, this is like the key thing to do. You, you'll see how powerful it is in one moment. Um, this is basically from the original paper itself. It, 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 I mean, you can see a picture of this in the original paper, but all of that has become much more simple, simplified and elegant here. Um, thanks to all the previous authors. Okay, so, uh, I'm going to define another key random variable, which I call UE. So for every edge E, IJ, UE is a random variable, which is the utility of, of buyer I in the run in which, in, uh, in the run RJ, in which J was removed. This is the, the key random variable which helps analyze the whole algorithm. Everything will come out alive right away. You'll see that. So, so I'm just gonna write this here. Uh, UE utility of I in RJ, where E is IJ. So for each edge, I have a different random variable. And this random variable also just determined by the entire algorithm. This is the key, okay? That's why I'm <laughs> leaving it on for some time. I cannot put it for the Zoom people. It's your fault, you should have been here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> any, any questions? I, I hope the Zoom people are able to ask questions. Yeah, yeah they can. Well, it's not, didn't you talk to? <laughs> Sorry, what? You, you had a conversation. Right? Oh, I, I know they can hear me, but uh, uh -huh. I don't know. I can also hear them. Maria talked to you back. Oh yes, Maria was uh, Maria. So Tony, hi. Good morning. I <laughs> think Tony is also there. Uh, hi, I'm here. <laughs> no okay. questions so far. Okay, awesome. Uh, anybody else can also ask. Uh, okay, thank you. So. Uh, Here's the critical fact, and, and, and you know, I've made this, uh, this is also very slippery stuff because, you know, independence plays a key role in all of these arguments. And uh, I've, I've slipped on this, this thing very badly when I really had a big result. And then uh, I realized that certain random variables were not independent. And then it became the smaller result, which I'm presenting now uh, with the big open problem. But the point is that uh, at least it's correct. And it's correct because I know that UE is independent of PJ. Why? Because UE was fixed in a graph in which J wasn't even present. Okay, and that's critical fact to be used in a moment. Okay, so, so uh, this is what we need to show that uh, the, some of the expectations of UE and RJ is at least one minus one over E. Uh, and we know that the random variable UE will always be at least U, uh, UI will at least be UE because I, UE is determined in a graph in which J is not even present, okay? If J is present, then I has more options. I has more options, so it will get even more utility. So UI will be at least UE, and therefore we get that uh, this sum is at least this sum in expectation, so, and, it turns out that we can show this as well, that the expectation of UE plus RJ is at least one minus one over E, 
and that will give the uh, earlier uh, statement that that was the lemma, the main lemma. So, oh, just because you said that there, there's some independence coming up, this inequality is for fixed random coins. The UI bigger. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is for each each this random coin. Each random coin. Yeah, for each run, if for each uh, execution of the first step, UI is at least UE. Okay, so we have we'll show this thing, and that's where UE will play this critical role that it that I've been promising it. It'll fit it. Okay. Awesome or not awesome? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, and how do we show this? Basically, what we'll show is that if UE is small, then the, then the expectation of RJ is large. Okay. If UE is large, we are done already, right? It's, it's V1 minus 1 over E and we are done. But so for this, we want to show for the entire range of UEs. Okay. So obviously, I'm not talking about expectation error, I'm talking about conditional expectation. So I'm just setting up the groundwork. So once I, I, I bounce on you with a, a conditional expectation, you know what to expect. Okay. okay. And th that expectation and expect was, was a one that I didn't intend at all. It, was, it never came up in the previous versions of this talk. Okay, so, uh, right, okay. We are fine. Okay, so. That's the whole idea. If UE is small, then expectation of RJ given UE must be large. And therefore, their sum must be large enough. Okay, so here's a crucial lemma that if PJ is small, okay, so UE has UE is what, what I got without even the presence of J. Okay. But if PJ is small enough, then, then the, the utility that I get without J is surpassed by the, the utility from J itself, right? Because price of J is small. And so we can easily see that J will definitely be matched because if it's not matched already before I arrive, then when I arrive, J is the maximum utility good for I. It's just cheaper. Cheapest. Yeah. Because it's cheaper. Maximum utility means one minus PJ is bigger than one minus UE. So PJ is RJ if it's big. Yes, PJ is RJ. Yeah. And so therefore, yeah. Is that okay? I, I hope. Can you please recall the definition of RJ? RJ is PJ if J is matched, zero if it's not matched. Okay. So PJ it lies in this range. And so what I'm saying is that whenever PJ lies in the range one over E to one minus UE, J is definitely matched. Therefore, revenue is accrued in, in J. How much revenue? PJ amount of revenue, right? And J is definitely matched because of this lemma, because uh, PJ is less than one minus UE. Okay, and that's how we will show that if, if u is small, this interval is large. So the, the revenue accrued will be, which will be some kind of an integral here, area under the curve will be large because we have a large interval over which to, will be accruing uh, revenue. And, and, and the flips for, coin flips for J happen after everything has happened because UE is determined without J. And then we'll flip the coins for J and, and J will end up where, you know, by itself, you know, through the same process as step one of the algorithm. Okay. And this also justifies the word threshold for this random variable UE, because this is the threshold such that whenever PJ is less than this threshold, J will be matched. Okay. So let's jump into the proof of this. So here is this uh, function T e to the X minus one which determines PJ. So PJ is determined by picking X at random from zero to one and computing this function. And uh, let's condition on uh, some value of Z in this interval zero to one minus one over E, because that's the interval from which UE comes. Uh, so we're conditioning on the fact that UE is Z and uh, let W be the value of X at which PJ is one minus Z. 
Okay, so at, at W, Pj is one minus Z. Okay, uh, and so W satisfies this equation, e to the W minus one is one minus Z, obviously. And we know that from that previous lemma that whenever X is in this interval less than W, Pj is less than one minus Z, and so revenue will be approved. So from the previous lemma, we know, we know that whenever Pj is less than one minus Z, revenue will be approved, right? So revenue will be approved whenever X lies in this interval, then Pj lies in this interval, and revenue will be accrued. How much revenue? Exactly PJ amount of revenue. So the revenue accrued is the is 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 lower bounded by the area under this curve. And so the green area is the lower bound on the revenue accrued. And why do I say low, lower bound? Why don't I say equal to the revenue accrued? But they may be fixed uh, anyway. They good, good, because because even if PJ. Even if X lies here and PJ is bigger than this value, than, than, than this value, maybe revenue is accrued. Nobody says that J will not be matched then. But we know that J is definitely matched whenever uh, X is in this interval. Awesome. So everybody is on board, right? Well, I know Avi is on board, but that's not saying, not saying too much, maybe. Oh, yeah, I hope it's a okay. It's not a shy audience. They will ask you questions. They don't have to worry. Thankfully, I'm not shy and you're not shy. So, so let's proceed. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, so now let's 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 compute the the expectation of the revenue approved. We we can compute easily the conditional expectation because that's that integral, the area under the curve, and that can be easily seen to be one minus one over e minus z. Okay, obviously it'll be in terms of Z. And to compute uh, lower bound on the revenue, we apply the uh, law of total expectation. So the expectation of RJ is the expectation of the conditional expectation. So we, we take the integral over Z going from zero to one minus one over E of the conditional expectation times the uh, density function. That'll just factor out very easily. That just apply to Z. And you get expectation UE here, and the rest just falls out as one minus one over E. Do you really use the index answer? Yes, sir. All fine. And now we are home free because uh, we take uh, UE to the other side, and we note that UI is bigger than at least as large as UE, so we got the lemma proven. 32 years went down the drain. Why? Huh? No, no, nothing goes down the drain. Oh, no, no, nothing went down the drain. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, since everybody got everything, let me tell you that uh, there's one thing that's still missing. Uh, which is that, uh, oh, I, I, I am reminding myself that there's a remark here, which is that this one minus one over E is not the, the, the gain from I matching to J, obviously, because, because this is the expectation of UI plus RJ. So it is, it is the gain from I matching to all Js and J matching to all Is over all the runs, obviously. It's not, it's not, what the edge ij will accrue because ij may never get matched but i may get matched to any j and j may get matched to any i and so the sum of these random variables has an expectation of at least one minus one over a okay ah uh, so so as i said uh, we are not done we are not done and the subtle issue that remains is that what everybody thought was okay was that this statement easily follows from whatever I said, no, because what we need for this is to show that in run R, some, so, so just because J is the best thing, better than anything that I can get without J, doesn't mean that J is the best thing that I can get with J, because once J is there, the whole matching can change. The first matching match edge can change, then the second match edge can change and, and everything can change. So we need to show that in run R, 
some other k doesn't pop up, which whose whose price is even smaller than p j and which has an edge to i. So then i will match to k, and j will remain unmatched. So so r j will not accrue any revenue. You see what I'm saying? Should I, should I repeat it? But uh, I mean, uh, it, there has to be a first sign in this. Uh, I mean, so I, 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 I think you're going towards the proof, but but uh, as long as the thing is clear, it's okay. And uh, and uh, I'm call, I call this the no surpassing property, that, and and it will play a critical role as we go on. Right now, it's a minor uh, matter in a, in in a, in a rather sub, you know other more substantial ideas. But it will start playing a bigger and bigger role soon. So that's why I'm making a big deal out of it. Uh, and some papers actually even skip this thing altogether, which is uh, not okay because there's a subtle point that has to be clarified. And you'll see what role it will play in a moment. Uh, Just a question. So yes. K would have been in the graph GJ. So yeah. yeah. But but the match of K could have happened to somebody else. So it was not available to I in GJ. But in G, it may become available to I. How do we know there's no such key? And so uh, I, I have proven it uh, in my paper and in the book uh, through, through these lemmas, which are simpler than the other lemmas that are, that are put forth by induction. Uh, but these lemmas also carry over to the more general situations. So anyway, I, I will come to those in a moment. OK, so we are ready to switch gears. And if you have any questions, well, the gears are switching. We can I can answer them. But but uh, and that goes uh, that goes the whole thing. I know. So so the, this gear switching is a is a very computationally heavy task. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I shouldn't have played it for too long. Sorry about that. So even more time to answer questions. Oops. So for yes. G and GJ, like the arrival order could be very different. Is that the issue? Because like- for, Arrival order is the same. Arrival we, order was fixed. And we also fixed the prices in the beginning itself. Uh, are also fixed. But because of J, some match, match could happen upfront, which changes every match from then on. But-, but um, didn't you condition on J not appearing up? So, 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 so you, you're thinking of a simple, uh, I mean, you, you think the, I, the proof should be simple and I quite agree with you. It's not hard. Okay. Just that, uh, one uh, later it will become important. If you, if you, if you're thinking it's, it's an obviousity, you're not far from the truth. So I don't want to, um, Play the gears again. Conditioned on J not being matched until that point, I don't see why the. So you're right, and, and, and let's not belabor it because because you're absolutely right. Okay, so 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 uh, I'm making a big deal for the future. Uh, otherwise, maybe it wasn't even worth mentioning, and and some papers, as I said, don't even mention it. So I, I'm not putting a fault. Uh, on them, but it's not a complete argument. So the paper should mention it. The talk need not have mentioned it, other than the fact that it will come up again in a big way. And it will really haunt us, haunt me, because <laughs> my big theorem collapsed because of this thing. OK. So I'm going to talk about matching markets. OK. So what are matching markets? These are matching markets. They match something to something. OK. Uh, and this looks like a mess completely. So let me put some order in it. So here are the pre-internet markets, match residents to hospitals, students to schools, kidney exchange. You must have heard of this many, many times over. Uh, these two are done with Gail Shepley, uh, stable matching. Then came the internet and all kinds of other markets came up, including the AdWords market that I'll really talk about. This matches uh, workers to employers. This matches uh, ads to uh, uh, YouTube videos to advertisers and so on. And uh, more came up with when mobile computing came up. So these really, it's the computer science revolutions of the internet and mobile computing that completely changed the picture of matching markets, which was a, a, a very distinguished field in itself 
and I'll say why I use that word. But yeah, here Uber and Lyft, you know what they do, ride sharing is when two people look for a, a ride in the same Uber. So you, you there to be a proximal in time and space. And when I mentioned time and space in I, AIS, it might mean something else altogether. So, uh, okay. So, and, and then there's one more market that I've not put here. It's the academic job market, right? Why did I not put it here? Well, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I did. <laughs> but I didn't put it here. Yes, I put it here. <laughs> You're right. Good. Okay. I, I, I like these uh, little tidbits. Okay. So I didn't put it here because, because this is the most ill behaved market of all. Okay. Every hire is a one off. You cannot do it uh, through any centralized uh, scheme like this. So, so this, is, this is a very, very poorly behaved market. Okay, we'll let it be, uh, even though it's of utmost importance to everybody, for you, soon. <laughs> okay, so, um, so in what sense are these markets? Uh, okay, here's a nice way to look at it. They are markets because they aggregate information held by participants, which is what markets do. And this is a, an email that Al Roth sent me after he saw my talk at Simon's. And I gave some not very good explanation and he was bothered and he said, this is why they are much markets. And indeed, you know, it clarifies it incredibly. So I always talk about this quote. And of course, you know that Al Roth and Lloyd Shipley got Nobel Prize in economics for matching markets in 2012. And uh, in 2020, Paul Milgram got it for spectrum options, but a lot of his work was also fundamental work in matching markets. Okay, so, and the, the big thing for us in computer science is that uh, matching markets have been connected to algorithms right from birth. And matching markets, the birth of matching markets came with the paper of Gale and Shetley on stable matching, which is 1962. Anything strange about that date? Pre-definition of polynomial time. That happened in 1965, uh, Edmunds. But this is a polynomial time algorithm. Okay, they didn't even know what, I don't know, they didn't even know formally what they were doing, otherwise they would have defined P right there. Uh, and it has incredible structure, which leads to polynomial time algorithms for so many things. So there's the Birkhoff representation theorem for finite distributive lattices, which gives uh, the notion of rotations, which help you traverse from the top to the bottom of this lattice, the lattice of stable matchings. Uh, and, and in polynomial time, you can do everything here. And then, uh, you know, the Birkhoff polytope for bipartite matching, there's an equivalent uh, polytope for stable matching, just like that. And then you can give a linear programming formulation to get uh, find stable matchings, not through the, the deferred uh, 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 acceptance algorithm of Gale and Shefley, but through LP. And then that gives you many other solves other kinds of problems altogether. So this polynomial time everywhere. And the only reason I can think of for that is that this problem comes from the same gold mine that the other matching things, namely matching theory. <laughs> that's that's the gold mine. Uh, can you quickly say what exactly is stable matching is? Oh, big story later. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, undergrad discrete math course. <laughs> so. Uh, too big a story. I'll, I'll tell you definitely over lunch. Okay, so so then the other thing is that uh, stable matching satisfies in incentive compatibility. Namely, the side that proposes in the deferred acceptance algorithm cannot cheat by, uh, cannot gain by cheating. And that suddenly opened up uh, this thing to many, many applications like, like matching uh, students to schools. So, so students are the ones that propose and they cannot uh, gain anything by cheating. So what does that mean? They just have to report their true, true preferences over the schools. And the earlier mechanisms, they could gain by cheating. So they were staying up all night, over many nights together with their parents, trying to see how to game the system. And, and it was a big mess, a big trauma for students and parents. And suddenly, you know, this is how things are done in New York City, where you admit almost 100,000 students every year and over 100 schools. It is done through Gail Shepley. 
Okay, that's why you know the Nobel Prize and all that big applications came about. But uh, so so this is the first life of uh, of uh, stable of uh, matching markets, if I may say so. Uh, and then came the second life after after the internet and mobile computing, and, and even bigger applications have come up. And I, the reason for that will become clear in a moment. And online byproduct matching and its generalizations, these form the uh, uh, algorithmic backbone in the second life, just like stable matchings forms the algorithmic backbone in the first life. And let me tell you why, tell you why I say this. Uh, so AdWords is a complete generalization of online matching. I'll show you why. Here, uh, 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 employees and employers come online and they get matched. So when the, both the sites come online, that's also been so, uh, uh, attacked. So there are many generalizations of online matching that have been attacked in a formal sense. And much of that forms the, the general principles on which you know, lots of these, uh, these, these applications work. Display ads is when, when the edges have weights and then you have to do free disposal to really get any good algorithm. Uh, uh, ride sharing is when two riders have to be matched to each other. So there's no bipartite nest there. This is non-bipartite online matching where nodes come with edges to the previous nodes and you have to match off a node right away if possible. Okay. So, and many, many more. I mean, I, I'm just giving you, so, so, and I'll say how, why, why this happened basically. And, 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 and the key problem among all of these is AdWords. Okay, this is uh, what is used uh, in the AdWords marketplace of Google. And so let's talk about Google a bit. So Google had two big innovations. One you would know about, which is search, you know, the page rank and all that, and fabulous search engine, which is what uh, gave them uh, uh, a market capitalization of, of 23 billion right at start. And, uh, and uh, in 2004, and by 2006, they had no way of monetizing based on this fantastic search engine. And the investors were all nervous and sweaty and, and, the, and, and the, uh, uh, the two Google uh, guys, uh, Page and Brin were rejecting all ideas because they, they wanted to keep the search results pristine and organic. And, and so most of our, the ideas involved interfering with that pristineness, they were rejecting it. Finally, this idea of AdWords came up. And as a result, this is where we are in Google. That 23 billion became 1.71 billion trillion. That's just for the investors, okay? For you and I who bought stock. But for everybody else who uses Google projects, whether it's search, whether it's YouTube, whether it's e Gmail, whether it's uh, apps, whether it's, uh, I mean, so many products, it has transformed our lives. Those are for free. And it's being paid from by, by this very market. It simply generates billions every year, okay? So it has changed, and, and moreover, in terms of, uh, as I said, the second idea was, was uh, that it has changed advertising. How? How does it work? So, uh, so when, when you type a word, say, Vioxx, uh, Google gives you these organic search results about Vioxx, and here are advertisements from companies that want, want that know that you are thinking about Yox and you want something related to Yox, and maybe it would be one of the companies here what has something to offer, okay? It could probably be pharmaceuticals or what have you, right? And, and so what happens is that uh, uh, advertising became highly targeted. So earlier, the way you do advertising is you put up a big billboard and millions see it and a few hundred buy that car. But, but the corner pizza store guy cannot put up a bill, big billboard uh, on the corner, right? So, and, and the maid who wants to get some more jobs cannot put up billboards or, or any, have any other way of advertising. So for all of them, Google was transformative for their businesses. And that's why this, okay. So the basic computational question in Google is, in keywords is how to allocate keywords to advertisers. 
Okay. And uh, uh, obviously, we want to maximize Google's revenue from Google's point of view, but that's also uh, it termed as the efficient solution in economics because if you give uh, the, the, the good or, or service to the person who's going to make the most out of it, then it's the best for the whole economy. Because they, they, by, by declaring a higher uh, utility or a higher bid, they're declaring the fact that they'll do more, more good to the economy, make it grow better, okay? Uh, so this is the efficient solution that we want to. So, so this dictates that we should give, so if you are displaying only one ad, we should give it to the highest bidder. That's what this dictates that and if you want to maximize Google's revenue, we should give it to the highest bidder, okay? And, 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 and that is, is what would result in what? So Yox actually turns out uh, several years ago, uh, this drug uh, was causing uh, heart trouble among, among some of the people who were taking it. This is an anti-inflammatory drug which caused heart, heart problems. And so what do you see here? Uh, not drug companies who want to sell more and more Yox because they could bid only 10 cents, 15 cents, maybe 25 cents, maybe 50 cents. But you see lawyers, 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 because they have bid somewhere between 50 and $100 to be here. Why? Because they want to attract attention of the patients who, who got hurt through Yox so that before they die, the lawyer can make some money from them, right? And so they have bid between 50 and $100 and that's the best for the economy, right? To give the to make to give the query Yox to them rather than to the drug companies, which can only give you give Google uh, ten or fifteen cents. Okay, so uh, am I am I losing people? Uh, I think I need a question or two to proceed. Yes, sir. No, I'm saying this makes sense. Makes sense. Oh, I thought you were. Oh, you have you were just scratching your head. <laughs> okay. It happens. No, no questions. It makes sense, right? Okay, so it makes sense. Does the pricing mechanism matter in the sense that it is? You said that you'd give it to the highest bidder. Yeah. And is it just first price? So if we had only, ad, if you were displaying only one ad, which is which is the simple thing to think about, that's what you would do. Okay, but let me tell you that 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 even though that solution was being used, there's a problem, and the problem is that that the matter is not as simple as that. When you go into Google's uh, website to set up your AdWords campaign, you declare all the keywords, but you also declare a daily budget. Okay, because if you're a small business, you have only $100 today. If they, if they give you ads worth uh, you know, $10,000, you you your business may shut down. Okay, so, so there's a daily budget typically. And now the whole equation has changed. You cannot just give it to the highest bidder. In fact, but in the worst case, you'll be back to factor half. And it's very easy to construct that example. Okay, over lunch, I can show it to you, that to you also. Uh, okay, so this problem came to us in 2004 as being uh, Aranak Mehta, Amin Saberi, Umesh, Vajrani, and me. And, and these, were, these two were my students at Georgia Tech then. He's now at Google, he's at Stanford. He was always at Berkeley and I'm at UC Irvine. So this is a highly California-centric problem now. So, uh, so, so what we, so what came to our our, our hands was a, was not this a clean problem, but a, a a problem with all the bells and whistles. And we decided, okay, first of all, we have to make the whole setup very simple, even if it is, if even if it, the solution is not exactly the one that is needed in reality, uh, it's close enough we can add the bells and whistles later. First, let's study the mathematics behind it. Second, uh, any solution we obtain should be real time and very, very simple because Google obtains its, you know, it is able to display search results within milliseconds. The ads have to come in the same time. If you're gonna solve a large LP to determine who gets the ads, which, which advertiser gets the queries, we are lost. Google's never gonna use that. Okay, so, and this is very important to take care of the budgets because the budget versus 
uh, number of advertisers uh, graph is has a very fat tail. And as I said, all these small advertisers, that's where Google's revenue comes from. So you have to deal with this issue very, very carefully and, and, and properly. Okay, and, and, and this is the AdWords problem as we uh, posed it back then. So advertisers are sitting here, queries are coming one at a time when users type and, and advertisers bid for queries, okay? Uh, an amount which depends on what the query word here is. So if it is Yox, there's a certain bid. Uh, if it is a, if it is a pepperoni pizza, then the probably lawyer doesn't have to bid anything, you know. And if it's uh, uh, men's clothes, then the pizza guy will not bid. But if it's a, a calzone, then the pizza guy will bid something else, maybe, you know. So this bids are all given in advance. In advance, based on the query word, yeah. and the query words come online. Yeah, but they are they are ready for every word. Sorry, they, they give this this table is known in advance. In advance, yeah, in advance, yeah. yeah. So the bids are known in advance. The daily budgets are known in advance. You just have to determine as a query comes which of these advertisers, one of them only, just for the mathematics, just to understand the mathematics. Right. One advertiser that that should get this query word, okay, and try to maximize the revenue. How does that mean maximize against the the offline best revenue. What can you do online? Okay, that's the big AdWords problem. Okay, uh, okay. So at that at this point, I mean this this online bipartite matching had already been done. This is a generalization, obviously. Uh, if the daily budgets are all one dollar, if the bids are all zero one, that's back to online bipartite matching. So we try to apply that. Failed completely. Oh uh, wait, is the uh, obvious thing of being greedy, just greedy. Yeah. Uh, gives one half. Zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just said that here. Yeah. Okay. Good. It's so very easy. Yeah. 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 Because now you told us the model. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was meant for this model. Yeah. That that remark. Okay. So, so, so then we we found out about this online B matching. I won't go into it. Uh, very nice work of Kalyan syndrome proves again one minus one over factor uh, works when the uh, for zero one bids only, and works when the budgets are very very large, much larger than one. Okay, but that's the right case that we want to be in. Namely, uh, budgets are much larger than bids but, because but, but larger than bids, but smaller than the graph. Uh, smaller than the graph. Yeah, yeah. The graph it's is not huge. like n. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like n. B is like a hundred. Yeah. So, so your 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 daily budget is like a hundred. Your bids are one dollar yeah, or fifty cents. Graph may have a million nodes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Any number of nodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So we took their algorithm and generalized it using all kinds of LP duality tricks, and it came down to this algorithm. You you simply compute one small matter, a certain function of the fraction of the budget spent. So you have to keep track of how much budget each advertiser spends. And you have to um, alter their bid by multiplying it by this f of the fraction of the budget spent. Okay, and so it's very simple, right? And then it, this this algorithm has a competitive ratio of one minus one over e, assuming bids are small, very small compared to budgets. Yes. So so somebody who has to spend anything, anything will be up here. Yeah, there. So. You're right. Excellent question. So their uh, effective bid will be large. So, so this is ensuring that everybody's spending goes in parallel. Goes, uh, it has parity. It's not that somebody spent everything and then somebody else spends. Why? Because somebody spends everything. Okay. Suppose they have bid. Uh, they have. They they want uh, CDs and keyword uh, CDs and books, and they got all the book queries. And then the CD queries come later in the in the day. This guy also wants only wants has wants book queries, but not CD. But maybe he spent he has a smaller bid for for books. This guy has a slightly bigger uh, bid for books. He gets all the bid uh, book queries. CD queries come late. His money is spent. He doesn't want CD queries. CD queries become uh, useless, and that's how the factor half proceeds. So this is like I'm just curious why it's like spent versus not spent. Like it doesn't matter. You can use f or one minus f or whatever. But the, for the max, it should matter, right? Uh, 
computing max of this. No, no, I can always put a F prime and put a max also. That's, yeah. Okay, so this is optimal also uh, against, uh, uh, among all uh, online algorithms in, with this uh, assumption, bid is much more slower than budget. And the point is that it's simple and minimalistic, which is what was needed. And that's the reason that it had a huge impact in the online, uh, in the search engine industry. And the bit scaling, which is the basic underlying idea in our algorithm, was extracted by these people and not used in this particular way itself, but used in many other ways. To, and just about all the search engine companies use bit scaling today. And then the search engine companies, of course, have lots of uh, different products of, 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 for advertising, display ads being one of them. And they have very, had very deep pockets. So they sponsored a lot of research along these lines on online by product matching and AdWords. And so many papers followed. And, and they made it like a pure science, you know, no stone unturned. Just whatever related to this, work on it, produce a paper. And then many of these uh, algorithms did find use maybe not in the search engine industry, but later when online, when mobile company came about, like for uh, uh, Uber, Lyft and all that, those, those algorithms were all ready-made there. So that's the big uh, advantage that came about. And then last year, or what is the, in the, in the good old pandemic uh, lockdown, uh, this idea came to me, uh, why not extend ranking, ranking to AdWords under small bits? The thing that had failed before, so where we, we failed before, but with the new simple proof of uh, ranking, maybe it can work out. And right. why is by, by randomly treating the prices for the- right, right, exactly, exactly, you got it. And why do this when there's already an algorithm? Because this approach is more elementary and it may lead to something better. And indeed, it does lead to something better, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. So, uh, but I didn't want to do it for, for this entire problem. It's very difficult to even think about it. So I did it for, extended it to single valued. What is single valued? Where every advertiser makes uh, bids of only one value, BJ. So it's not zero one, it's BJ dollars for, for advertiser J. Okay, and uh, advertiser J's budget is KJ BJ, where KJ is the number of successful bids uh, he can make. And a query comes, and uh, he, he makes a bit of BJ, and uh, and uh, uh, oh no, he doesn't make a bit of BJ. Again, you flip coins, produce PJ as Avi just uh, uh, predicted, and you make a, an uh, effective bid of BJ times one minus PJ. So remember, when BJs were zero one, which is uh, online matching, they were the bid was one minus PJ. Now it's BJ times one minus PJ, and I will pick the highest bid. And, and if I and J are matched, then the revenue is uh, increased by BJ, PJ. And uh, utility it, of I is defined to be BJ times one minus PJ. Everything is generalized from online matching. And uh, this algorithm is budget oblivious. It doesn't need to know what the current budget of J is. It just needs to know whether J is completely spent out or not. Whether J is able to make a bid or not. And that has an advantage, I'll come to it in a moment. But what I need to do now is not think about single edges, but J stars, what is the J star? It is J together with K edges, uh, where K is, is, is this case of J. So, so a J star is J together with all possible K edges. Each of these is a J star. And instead of talking about, so the contribution of this J star is the revenue of J plus the total sum of the utilities of these each of these uh, uh, queries. So this is it's different than B matching because it's, oh, oh yeah, B matching is just zero one bits. I thought that in, well from what I remember maybe it's not there. Anyway, the point is is that rather than matching every J to a single pair I, you match J to K or KJ single I. 
Sorry, each, sorry, so say it again. Each uh, J, each advertiser. Has to, has to be matched to KJ, yeah. Yeah, so it's not a matching, it's a, you know. Oh, no, 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 it's not a matching. Yeah, it's not a matching. Single what one is, is produced at the end is a collection of stars. Stars, exactly, exactly. Opt is also a collection of stars. Yeah. And that's why, so remember, opt in the case of online bipartisan matching was, a, was one perfect matching. In this case, it'll be a bunch of stars that exhaust all the queries in, in if you have a perfect matching. And what needs to be proven is, is precisely this. This is the lemma that generalizes the central lemma there. Namely, for every star, its expected contribution is k times bj times 1 minus 1 over e. And this can be done through all the machinery extended quite substantially, I must say, the, the probabilistic machinery, and then extending also the combinatorial machinery to to prove no surpassing for this setting, this is this is this is easy. The probabilistic machinery is where the real work gets done. Okay, and then we are all set to move to AdWords with small bits. Okay, ah, so this is budget obliv oblivious optimal algorithm for for single valued budget oblivious in the sense that you don't you don't need to know the budget. You just need to know when the budget is exhausted. What's the use of that? Because now you can use it in um, uh, uh, these advertisement platforms. So there are people who will run your ad campaign and, and send ad, uh, your bids to multiple uh, search engines, okay? And keep adjusting the bids and budgets uh, dynamically. So you give them one large budget and how much they give to Google or to Facebook or to Amazon, they adjust dynamically. So of course the bits can be adjusted dynamically depending on what's going on. But if the if Facebook needs to know the budget, you, you cannot suddenly say, hey, budget is not 100, it's, it's 500. But if you don't have to tell them the budget, then you can use it. And that's the big advantage of budget oblivious. That's why it's so important to, to do AdWords under small bits using this idea. But what fails here is the no surpassing property. Everything, all the probabilistic stuff, which is a difficult part, carries through all the way. This thing falls on its face. This is uh, the analysis using this. Uh, this uh, it is an artist. Where you don't include. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. All of that carries through, but the no surpassing property, which is very, some very simple combinatorial lemmas, that doesn't work out. In fact, I have a counter example. Many. <laughs> yeah. So, but so so I stated this in my paper, which is on in archive, as a conditional theorem. So assume the node surpassing property, then you have a budget oblivious and optimal algorithm. And I feel that quite we have this conditional theorem if you have counter examples to the no surpassing. Because of this reason, because I feel that this no surpassing property fails for very few queries. And if this can be checked experimentally, then you can still use the algorithm. And the advantage, of course, is that you have you can use it in auto auto bidding platform because of the budget obliviousness. So this is not my cup of tea to check this experimentally, but I would be thrilled to see a complete mathematical solution of this hole. If somebody patch this hole, it's not straightforward, but I'm happy to collaborate with anybody who has uh, 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 the horsepower to do, <laughs> to 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 offer. To, to do it. Uh, okay. Uh, Quick question. Does the algorithm fail uh, when the NSP fails or do you just not? Just the analysis it? fails. Just the analysis, okay. Do that, yeah, yeah. That's why, yeah, that's why I say that, that, that it will still, I mean, whenever in any instance in which NSP works out, you get one minus one already. Right. Okay. I'm done, this is the last slide. So here are some recent developments. Uh, I found out, about a month ago, somebody I, I sent this paper to somebody, and they sent me this paper of uh, Susan Albers and her, her, her uh, uh, student Schubert uh, um, that that they had a paper about single valued but with zero one bits. Okay, so so my stuff generalizes this also, but this was a paper in Approx Random uh, last year. So this I just want to say that online bipartisan matching after thirty years is still alive. And you here, you'll see even more how it is alive. Uh, this year, Milena Mihail and uh, Thorben Prost, who's my student, uh, 
they gave the for, for the first time a high probability statement for ranking. So I've, I've, so far I've given only an expectation statement. They converted it to a high probability using Azuma's inequality and all that. And there's many more things happening. I mean, there's some natural generalizations that Thorben, Kropf, and I are studying, and uh, we are not there yet. Otherwise, I would have said what these are, but it's part of his thesis, so I don't want to say more. But the point is there are several other very interesting papers that have come about recently in the last two years. One is on edge-weighted matching, which just got, so there's a claimed one minus one over for that uh, from a French mathematician. And then some people say it works, some people say it doesn't work. I, I don't know what the, what the final word is, but if it doesn't work, it's again back into, uh, into play. And that's just a very basic small generalization of online matching. You mean the edges have weights. Can you believe it after 30 years? There's a basic thing that's still alive after so many papers. Uh, so, and I think there are more uh, such, as, such as this one. The, the, the best thing is, I mean, the, the most effective way to deal with those is, 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 is of course, to look for the right question to attack. And, and then you'll get a great result to people who are three people here who have PhD thesis to finish. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, question for Richard. Yes, sir. Um, so just, I'm wondering, the, um, this whole online analysis is very worst case. Mm -hmm. and I'm interested in, you know, it's being used in practice, the ideas are being used in practice. So indeed, in practice it's indeed, not indeed, indeed. There, are, there are so many works on, on, pro, uh, on uh, you know, doing it for, uh, Queries coming from a distribution or queries coming in a random order, so many works. So, I just think, you know, doing this, the, that one minus one over with one minus little over one, uh, one key reference is Devanur Hayes. Yeah, so indeed, very good question. And, and of course, Google knows what happened yesterday and what happened one year ago and what happened two years ago. And one over E is a lot when you multiply it by Google's revenue. Of course, yeah, you, yeah you're not going to leave that much money on the table. But it goes up from a half, and so it's really saving some money out of that table. So, and, and every now and then Google does run into worst case. You know, some event happens, okay, uh, a war breaks out, and people look for something else. So, are the ideas very different in those works? Is it sort of explore, exploit? Or... Just look them up. There are many, 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 many papers, very many different. Uh, it's been thoroughly explored. Yeah. Any, any other? But very good question. I should have. But I, I, and there are so many things to mention here. <laughs> my, my time was very short compared to what I had to cover. So sorry. Yeah. Any anything else? All questions. I think Maria looks like she has a question. No, really? Okay. All right. Good. Then we'll okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you for coming. Everybody.